Okay, class, I'm going to go over Chapter 6 today. In Chapter 6, I was, it's a continuation over the normal distribution and the use of probabilities to make decisions. And this will help when you get into all those hypotheses and H1, HO, and I'll tell you what that stuff is. Um, what probably communicates how probability is an event relative to frequency to the pop population, how the probability of a sample mean is computed using z-scores and the standard normal curve, which we just went over. What sampling error is and how random sampling can produce representative and unrepresentative samples. We talked about that earlier, too. How to use sampling distribution of means to determine whether a sample is likely to represent a particular population, and that's what we're trying to do. The probability of an event is to equal to the event's relative frequency. How, re how, how, how relative is this going to happen, or what is the probability of this occurring in nature or our natural surroundings? A probability distribution indicates the probability of all possible events in that population or that particular variable that we're measuring. An empirical probability, and the word empirical basically means scientific. A scientific probability distribution is created by observing the relative frequency of every event in that particular population or that event that we're measuring, whatever that variable is. The theoretical probability distribution is based on how we assume nature's, nature distributes events in a population. How probable is this that this event will occur in nature? Obtaining probability from the standard normal curve, the proportion of the total area under the normal standard curve, and we've gone over that a little bit, but I'm going to go over it again, for the particular scores equal the probability of those scores. There's a 95% probability that, you know, scores are going to fall between plus and minus three standard deviations from the mean. To compute the probability, use the same technique she's learned in finding the area under the normal curve, which we went over last uh, video, using z-scores and the z-tables. And I'll talk to you about that in just a few minutes. Here's the curve, and we talked about this plus one standard deviation accounting for 34.13% of the total area of the normal distribution. We know that half is cut by the mean, mode, and median here. They all fall at zero, and we know that 50% is, is over here. This is symmetrical. This is the same as this. So we can still see our standard deviations, and we have some raw scores here. Now, it doesn't really tell us what the raw scores are, but they could represent anything. As long as we know what those standard deviations are, we will know what a raw score, what the relativity or the probability of that occurring in that particular uh, variable. A type of probability distribution known as sampling distribution of means is used to compute the probability of obtaining particular means. And basically all that means is sampling distribution of means. So like I, if I take a bunch of samples and then I find the mean of means, and I'm going to assume that those mean of means are going to be equally distributed on a normal distribution, then I can use that standard normal Z distribution. And here it is again. Sample means. So I'm getting all these different sample means, but as long as they fall within the normal distribution, I can assume that I've caught the true population here. Well, I, as long as my, my sampling techniques were that, that I was catching the true population and not some other population that I wasn't trying to catch. The probability of selecting a particular sample mean is the same as the probability of randomly selecting a sample of participants who produce scores resulting in that sample mean. So in real life, what we're doing is we're taking a mean and or a sample and we're finding that mean and we're going to
going to assume or we're going to generalize that that particular mean is relative to the particular population that I'm trying to study. So if I'm looking at 8th grade boys and their behavior problems, and I take a sample in Oklahoma, I'm going to generalize or assume that those same problems are occurring all over the United States. So my population would be 8th grade boys in the United States, and my sample would be taken from Oklahoma, let's say. The larger the absolute value of sample means, z-scores, the less likely the mean is to occur when the sample are drawn from underlying raw scores. So the better your sampling techniques, the better chance is that you're going to not make critical errors when you're saying that the mean is a true mean on a normal distribution. A representative sample is one in which the characteristics of the individuals and scores accurately reflect the individuals in the population. Like I say, if I'm wanting to study 8th grade boys, I wouldn't look at 4th grade boys or 8th grade boys from last year. I would take current 8th grade boys and their behavior problems. Sampling error occurs when the random chance produces a, a sample statistic not equal to the population per parameter it present, represents. So sampling error is always going to occur. I'm always going to have some kind of error. Scientific procedures like hypothesis testing, I can determine what my sampling error is. So I can say I'm going to set my sam sampling error at 5%. That's called an alpha level. So basically, there's a 5% chance that I could make an error, that my results are not going to be accurate. But there's only 5% chance. There's a 95% chance that my results are going to be accurate. So a lot of times you hear, well, there's a 95% chance that you know, we're reporting the true score in a lot of political polls and things like that. And that's where this is coming from. There's always going to be sampling error, but with research, I can set what that sampling error is. I can say my alpha level, or my error level, I'm going to set that at 0 .05, and that's basically 5%. So I'm saying that there's a chance, and there's a 5% chance that I could be wrong. When I you know, post my results or publish my results, there's a 5% chance that those results are not true. It is always possible to obtain a sample that is not representative. There's always a chance. But if we set our alpha levels and things like that, we're reducing that to a small, uh, a small amount. But we are in control if we're a researcher and a scientist. We need to make sure that we do not poorly represent the population. We need to accurately represent uh, the population that were intended, not some different population. At some point, the sample mean is so far above or below the population mean, it is unbelievable uh, chance produced such an unrepresentative uh, sample. Now, sometimes that's what we want. When we're trying to change behavior, or we're trying to uh, get someone to stop smoking or something like that. We know what the average person, how many cigarettes they smoke. So if we can drastically reduce that, and it's so far below the mean that you know we've changed that person's behavior, sometimes that's what we want to do. But sometimes in industry, uh, a lot of times we don't want that mean to be different. We want it to be the same. So if, I, if I'm a Coke down here in Okmulgee, and I know that the Coke bottles are supposed to contain, you know, let's say, what is it, 12 ounces of Coke, but I don't know for sure if the, if the machines are calibrated. So I'm going to go in and take a sample of Coke bottles, and I'm going to measure the amount of Coke in those bottles. So I don't want it to be so far above or below the mean. I want that to be real close to the mean to make sure that I'm saying that when you buy a bottle of Coke, you're getting 12 ounces. 
Then we're going to talk about areas beyond these points. Those are called the region of rejection. So sometimes I'm going to say, well, I want that mean to be so different. But other times you're going to say, I don't want it to be different. I want it to be the same. The region of rejection is the part of the sampling distribution containing the values unlikely that we reject the idea that they represent the under underlying raw scores of the population. They're not the same as the population. They're different. And like I say, sometimes we're going to want to do that and sometimes we're not. So the region of rejection, and like I, I use the example of 5% of the time, well this would be the, where I would talk about that. So I'm going to set my alpha level or my region of rejection at 0.05. So if I'm looking at both tails, and this would be like a two-tailed, I'm going to split my alpha level. I'm going to take alpha and divide it by two and put half of alpha here and half of alpha here. So I'm looking at 2.5% of all the possible scores are going to be here and all the possible scores are here. So if my mean falls in these region, either region of rejection, I have to assume that this sample is not the same as the population. It's different. The criterion is the probability defining samples are unlikely to be representative of that population. So like I say, sometimes I want it to be different. But in other instances, I want it to be the same. The critical value marks the inner edge of the region of rejection. So there's going to be a score, a z-score, that represents what is that particular region of rejection. And for a, like 0 0.05 or 95%, if I set my alpha level at 0 0.05, then the region of rejection is going to be 1.96, or almost two standard deviations. When a sample's z-score lies beyond the critical value, then I reject the idea that those, those populations are the same. My sample is not the same as the population. When the z-score does not lie beyond, well, I'm, I'm going to say that these are the same. The sample is going to be the same as the population. Two-tailed tests. Well, we reject the idea the sample mean is represented if it falls in either negative or positive tail. And that's what the example showed. Now, a one-tailed test, we're going to determine, like a lot of times I might say, well, I want to reduce the amount of cigarettes that someone smokes. So I would be looking at the negative side of the test. Or I want to increase, um, let's say, self-esteem. I want to increase self-esteem. So I will be looking at the positive side of, of the score, or the, of the uh, distribution. If we are interested in positive z-scores, we reject the idea that the sample mean is going to fall anywhere in the negative side. It will, it will be on the positive side. If we are interested in negative z-scores, then all we're going to look at is the negative side of that distribution. Like, you know, I want to reduce cigarette smoking, or I want to increase um, self-confidence or something like that. So we can use either tail or we can use both tails. Uh, a sample of 10 score yields a sample mean of 305. Does the sample mean represent the population where the sample population mean is equal to 325 and the standard deviation is equal to 25? So we'll do that same uh, formula that we did a while ago, and we're going to find out what our standard error of the mean is, and we're going to plug that into our z formula, and we're going to find out what our, our particular z value is. And if that particular z value falls in that critical region, we're going to reject that the idea is that those, that sample is part of the population. We're going to say that it is not part of the population. And in this instance, we've had, we find that we have a z-score of negative 2.53. With a 
the criterion of 0 0.05, like I was talking about, in the region of rejection with two tails, the critical value is 1.96. And that's on either side, so we're using a two tailed. Since the sample Z score of negative 2.53 is beyond that, I'm rejecting that the, pop, the sample that I took is part of that population. And basically that's called a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis means that mu1 is equal to mu2, or sample mean is equal to population mean. Well, I'm going to reject that because they're not the same. They are significantly different based on my critical value of 0.05 or 5% of the tail ends of that distribution. And that's it. I'll come back with another video.